the Research and Development Cell of Kannur University, in association with the Internal Quality Assurance Cell, organized a public lecture program on various topics from the 12th to 23rd July 2022. And the sixth lecture was on the topic Fire on Ice. And the speaker was Dr. Tamban Melat, Scientist G, Polar Sciences, National Center for Polar and Ocean Research, Goa. So the today's title was supposed to be a little more smaller, Fire on Ice. That is basically to attract to all of you. I would let me put this way. So the actual title which I want to talk today is basically on the real thing which are in fact uh, it's exactly both the same. That was more fascinating uh, for uh, people unknown to the area. So I would be talking today about an area where uh, most of us are not really living today but at the same time where we are going to be affected in coming days. So I would like to bring to you that how it's going to be Okay, it's this way. So, uh, what we must have heard actually last couple of months actually that uh, when the IPCC 6th, uh, you know, the uh, assessment report came, that a lot of things have changed in this world, things changed forever than much worse than what we ever imagined, so about uh, our generation or even our the past generations. For example, if you look at CO2, the carbon dioxide, which actually we are always blaming for the global, you know, climate change and so on. It's been for the for the past two million of uh, millions of years, it was never to this level. 420 ppm V is actually really so high than actually at least for the past two millions of years. And majority of these uh, gas actually we know very clear it is basically the man-made. If you look at the sea level, it's again actually is at least for the last 3,000 years we have never had this level of sea level. We we most of us live in the coastal areas is getting affected. And more, the, my area of interest today actually I will be talking about the ice and the glaciers, how they are affecting. Even they are, for example, the current sea ice conditions in Arctic. I will talk about what is the difference between Arctic and Antarctic actually so that you know actually what we, when we speak about that. So they are the lowest level than forever at least for the last 3000 years or that is 1000 years. And the glaciers, especially the mountain glaciers which we see in the Himalayas and other places, they are at least... Uh, for the last 2000 years, you know, that, that's again one of the lowest uh, level. When we talk about polar regions, we generally speak, I think more, some of you are, I mean, these days most of you are aware actually, unlike our generation, we were only used to look at some maps here and there, where this Antarctica and Arctic and all. The new generation have so much information, <coughs> in fact it's an information overload. So there is no lack of information, it's only that uh, you're seeking that information is becoming more difficult these days. So we are very aware there is Antarctica is there actually sitting down south and Arctic is in the north. And Antarctica is essentially a continent, a continent of nearly about 4.5 times of Indian subcontinent. And a continent which is made of ice as thick as 4 kilometers in some places. And a continent as cold as sometimes minus 90 degrees Celsius and so on. So it's a huge continent surrounded by the ocean. Compared to what is seen in Arctic, which is in the north, an ocean, essentially the Arctic is an ocean frozen, like a sea ice. Sea ice is nothing but the sea water frozen and that ice is different from what you see in Antarctica. And sea ice could be of a single year and it could also be multiple years of ice. So that is why Arctic is losing ice mass much faster compared to that of Antarctica. And Antarctica therefore we call actually essentially a water hemisphere because actually it is 90% water except for the Antarctica. And Arctic is, a, the, is essentially in the northern hemisphere where it is basically land hemisphere and where is a water coverage is only about 50%. Then there is another uh, pole which we never normally do not think as polar region that is the Himalayas. We call them as third pole. They are third pole because actually one of the largest reservoir of ice beyond these two poles number one. They are also the highest having the highest mountains of the, of the all tallest 10 peaks in the world. And it is also the source of 10 major rivers in the world, the largest rivers in the world like India, Indo, Indus, Ganges, Brahmaputra and so on. So all this makes this area like is, the third pole is not just about Himalaya, it is also about the large area permanently frozen, entire Tibetan regions which is permanently frozen, we call them permafrost. 
And as the climate is warming, this area is actually going through a large changes because actually as the, the land get warmer, there are a lot of things changes like we see hazards, plenty of hazards happening in the, these particular regions because of that. Why are the polar regions so important? Because most of us live in tropics, <coughs> especially in a place where actually things are, you get rainfall almost assured about two to three months. We get uh, summer, very warm summers and very less winters. So why do we really worry about getting you know, the so cold areas? But you should understand that actually whatever we see the climate today is an, is an over, you know, complete uh, you know, process of the way mostly happens in the polar regions because they are the place most of the, you know, the, you know, the, the climate get generated because of the peculiar conditions. They are also one of the most warmest or the most, uh, what you call the most uh, vulnerable part of the warming world. And more importantly, in future, as we all know that actually fresh water is going to be one of the most rarest thing in this world. Polar regions have the 80 percent of the fresh water in the world. And if you are there are students who are studying biology, you would also know actually you'll find most of the amazing uh, life in Antarctica, which has the not only curiosity, it all, not only you know, evokes curiosity from us, but also they have their own applications to understand how life survives in extremes. They have a pristine environment, which we know that actually that they are much pristine than compared to the rest of the world. And how many of you know that India and Antarctica has a long, long, long history? History because India and Antarctica was several about nearly about 200 millions of years before actually we were all together. So essentially we are siblings. We got separated when the Gondwana, the large supercontinent got start breaking away and you know India started moving, touching the Eurasia, forming Himalaya and uh, the, what we see as today. Our climate for example, the, because of the Himalaya only we have this current climate now. Whereas India and Arctic even has today has direct connections. Indian climate, for example, the monsoons, what we see today, we see every year there are year to year changes. We blame them on something happening in Pacific Ocean like El Nino Southern Oscillation. We blame them something happening in the Southern or some other oceans. And one of the main culprit why our monsoon can be erratic could be the what happens to the, the uh, Arctic sea ice. Arctic sea ice and uh, Indian monsoon have a direct uh, linkage through what we call actually atmospheric bridge. I will not get into details of that actually to not to make you bored about that. But they have a direct uh, imp impact on the Indian monsoon. In fact, I will show one more slide later on. As far as uh, uh, governments which fund us funds for such projects, it uh, has a direct and uh, you know indirect benefits of doing research in Antarctica and uh, Arctic. One is there is a, they are going to be economically vital in a future because we are going to have resource crunch everywhere. We are looking into oceans. We are also looking into areas where are unexplored. For example, Arctic. Arctic sea ice is melting has become a very important uh, you know uh, global political you know event because there are going to be large resources available in the deep ocean because the Arctic region also has a lot of natural gases. And there's a huge fisheries, the entire, the, what you call the, the cold water fisheries actually, you know, so, you know, existing in that area. And then the entire uh, shipping road is going to open, northern shipping road is going to be one of the major change in the coming 20, in, the, in the 21st century as well as in the few years in the next uh, centuries. It will change the world face, that's the, the, that's the, the, the Arctic sea ice is uh, retreating and the sea, the, the sea route get opened up. Finally, as I said, actually, they're going to be strategically and geopolitically so important. That's why recent, actually, recently you must have seen actually the, the, even countries like India, which is not a direct uh, polar country, are coming with uh, our policies for Arctic and Antarctic. Like current season, uh, current, current uh, the monsoon session, actually, we have actually already our Antarctic bill is in the parliament. Last uh, few months back, last time we all got our Antarctic policy approved and so on, sorry, Arctic policy approved. So all this is going to be very extremely important. That's one reason actually we, why we should be studying. That, that means the future is going to be much more exciting for polar regions than what we are today. Antarctic, as I said actually, is a large continent, double the size of United States and nearly 4.5 times of Indian subcontinent. As I said actually, it's huge, enormous. 
coldest, highest, windiest, driest and iciest place on earth. That makes it actually a lot of superlatives which makes the, that place actually quite unique than any other parts of the world. Would you believe that Antarctica is the coldest desert or the, or the, the most desert place in the world? It's one of the coldest part on the earth because the moisture actually, if you look at the, uh, this particular graph, oh yeah. okay, it doesn't work on, the screen is different, okay, I got it. So, if you look at the, the entire, the precipitation actually, like uh, Sahara has a precipitation less than one meter per year. If you look at this map and you look at this color of change here, most of the entire Antarctica has actually even less than 15 centimeter you know, per year or so. It's an extremely dry place. For example, if there is a fire in Antarctica in one station, even a small this one, it just uh, you know, get uh, so fast. So it's, although it's so cold, temperature could be minus 90, but it could be so dry that everything will blow up in no time. If you look at here, actually, that's the precipitation. How much, uh, you know, the rain it receives? Uh, sorry, the what is the temperature? You can see the the coldest part is of in the interior Antarctica. It can be as cold as minus 60 to minus 90. In fact, I experienced about minus 60 when we travel all the way to uh, South Pole. South Pole is somewhere here. This Antarctica, this part we call actually East Antarctica. This is called West Antarctica. This is called Antarctic Peninsula. So just remember these terminologies if at all I in between I talk. This is somewhere here is actually the South Pole. What you call the geographic South Pole, 90 degrees south. India had only once one expedition to South Pole, which I could uh, I was lucky to participate. If you look at as I said, actually Antarctica has a lot of role in Antar in global climate, simply because if you imagine a mirror of Indian, uh, you know, about five times of Indian subcontinent sitting there, which is completely white, where 80 percent of the, you know, the sunlight is reflected back. It's a giant mirror sitting there. Therefore, it becomes a, what you call the, it becomes uh, the coldest part on Earth because everything gets reflected back. So nothing actually gets absorbed. And therefore, the climate of that area basically starts uh, controlling the global system because of its size, enormous size. And not only that, Antarctica is also surrounded by the, uh, the ice which is frozen from the sea water, what we call a sea ice. Sea ice has its own importance actually because of the global, the oceanic circulation, what we see today. For example, you must have studied in some geography books where actually the, the Gulf Stream has actually the, you know, the blanket of the Europe and so on. All these are essentially because of the sea water which uh, get, uh, you know, the formation of this, uh, the ocean currents. Ocean currents form because of this, uh, what happens in the polar regions because of the, when the sea ice forms, ice get, uh, sorry, the salt get ejected and uh, the ice forms and salt get ejected and salt makes the water very dense. The dense water starts sinking. Once it starts sinking, then it starts flowing around actually because of the density difference and so on. So it makes the whole circulation happens, which is like a huge, uh, you know, uh, snake you can see around, going around within the global oceans. So this is what actually, the more importantly, many of us know that actually we, the, the humans have been generating so much CO2, but still we are able to survive. Why? The oceans have been, you know, taking so much of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, helping us to live this world, of which the southern ocean, southern ocean is the ocean surrounding the uh, Antarctica, takes up nearly 40% of that CO2. Remember, because Southern Ocean is so cold, that's why it's able to take more CO2, you know, it's able to absorb more CO2. But as we are getting warmer, the ability of CO carbon dioxide, so Southern Ocean, to, you know, absorb more CO2 can be less, it can reduce. So, in ultimately, we are going to again suffer if you are feeding more CO2 else because the globe is warming. And for many of you, some students who are interested in life in Antarctica, how do life survive? That itself, that itself is entire, another lecture it could be actually, what are the mechanisms these uh, life actually to survive in these conditions? I will not get into that details. Rather, I just want to say actually, Antarctica has extensive species diversity unlike you think. Especially at the microbial level. The, what you call the higher level, Vascular plants you don't have except one, you know, the, this one small, this one actually existing in the Antarctic Peninsula, but otherwise there is no vascular plants. But there is a life much above that, <coughs> many of them like uh, 
most importantly of course you must have heard mostly about the, the when you th think about antarctica we remember penguins basically the, the the bird bird species actually what we typically see here but there are also many others like squaws petrels and uh, albatross and so on as we get closer to antarctica you can see all this and uh, among mammals you have only seals whales dolphins most of these are actually marine mammals there is no mammals on antarctic land remember that the true land creatures in antarctica only invertebrates invertebrates like uh, midges mites ticks all this kind of thing i would come back to another thing tardigrades what are these so antarctic invertebrates has an important role to understand the different other planets they are like more like other planets than this planet like they are less like our earth and more like an, another planet because antarctic <coughs> terrestrial invertebrates are the most resilient resilient features living on the world for example tardigrades this particular one this one species is extremely interesting and actually important because their ability to go into you know cryptobiosis for example that's only one mechanism i'm just talking about where actually they can be completely inactive metabolically but they're still alive although their lifespan is only few months or few weeks sometimes they can actually run for several decades in cryptobiosis can you imagine a life which got only about uh, just uh, two months of life but they're able to live more than 30 years that's that's the that's the example of life which we require when you think about a place like mars or other you know other planets because there will be conditions will be worse than this so there could be life like this which are has that potential to evolve as conditions are getting really bad and how do they do it you know they also become very scientifically very interesting for a lot of people because we want to know how do they actually do it and what are the factors affecting them and more importantly what can is what can they tell us about other planets that's going to be very important for us because as i said antarctica is like more like other planets than the earth itself and therefore they can stand in for actually some other planets like mars for example that would be very interesting and uh, to, therefore if you want to study those planets life in the, those planets this is going to be important to study antarctica okay there could be one kind of confusion actually which i should have even cleared much before does antarctica belong to anyone because we know most of the continents actually are already occupied by human beings and we have we see the increased space of this political movement actually which going around the world actually people fighting for even small lands and even small islands in the past left out in the world for which the big difference is antarctica antarctica is really no man's land means anybody can actually be the as long as you don't hurt its environment and antarctica is only for peaceful purpose and it's only for uh, science because all this could happen because one treaty which has been really successful in this world like in the past what we must have heard montreal protocol that's something like this is something antarctic treaty was one of the biggest uh, you know golden rule which really helped this continent to survive <coughs> otherwise by this time it would also have been a big uh, trouble antarctic treaty system which came into picture in 1959 signed by about 44 countries which represents nearly 80 percent of the world's uh, population is the one actually made it uh, work without you know people therefore you cannot have the militaries and other thing cannot occupy that place we can only go for science that's also one reason why governments invest money on science in these countries this continent and this hopefully this treaty will uh, go forever as long as unless some geopolitical things again changes which we never know because the world is changing so fast we never know how things will change in arctic as i said actually it's a more of a kind of you know arctic ocean which is frozen what you see the white is essentially nothing but a frozen sea water sea ice we call it then there are a few islands like greenland and some of these the arctic uh, regions like the scandinavian countries the the canadian arctic the alaska and the siberian uh, the part of the russia and so on so there is large uh, you know in, in, in the, the, the most unlike antarctica each one of this belong to some countries that's why exactly why arctic become more geopolitically sensitive <coughs> but what is more important for a climate scientist as well as a, a natural scientist is that actually arctic sea ice has been dramatically decreasing for the last uh, you know several decades by 2050 we expect the north the sea ice route 
sorry, the, the at least in the summer, what is for one month actually, there will be sea ice will be completely free in the uh, Arctic, which will make the shipping route to really happen. Currently, you require an ice class vessel to move, which actually can cut through the, the size, which makes it very expensive as well as not worthy of trying it. But in future, all that could be. So think about having a route here for all those countries from Europe and America to able to access from here to reach to Asia. That's why that is becoming so important for each of these countries, why they are fighting for this place. Currently, people, all the ships has to come, the Atlantic, come through the Suez Canal, reach to Indian Ocean, and then, you know, get through all this, you know, the, even the countries like Singapore is want to join an Arctic Council simply because, you know, you know that Singapore is such a small country, just like an island sort of thing, very small, like a state like Goa, for example. But they have so much interest in Arctic simply because their shipping route will be affected tomorrow because their entire money makes up the international trade and all that. So as a, another you know, as a shipping route opens, this is going to be completely different. So they want to, if they, something happens, we want to be there like. So in fact, there is also an observe in Arctic Council because of that. So there are a lot of things other than just only purely what you think as, uh, you know, these regions as important. Third pole, as I said, is a large area of, you know, Hindu Kush, Himalaya, uh, in Tibetan regions, which is home to largest rivers like Indus, Ganges, Brahmaputra, this uh, you know, Tarim, that Yangtze, and a lot of the largest rivers on the world, where the entire population of the world sits. In fact, almost you know 80 percent of the world population actually survives. So therefore, they have become very important, and therefore the the loss of glaciers in the Himalayas also become very important for the society. The example, they are going to be critical for life, economy and energy needs of Asia. If you look at the kind of population living, each of this one, this one about 10 million. So you can imagine this is about a, a large, uh, about uh, 600 million people lives on uh, in this river. Like uh, another one, Zhang says another 600. So that's the kind of the people live, survive on these rivers. Near, nearly about 2 billion people get affected by the loss of water in these rivers. So therefore, and most of these rivers are fed by glaciers, the melt of glaciers. <clears throat> As the glaciers become more thinner and thinner, after some time, there won't be any water coming from these glaciers. That's going to be important because they are the main water resource during the summer time. The, if, during the mon monsoon time, you may get some rains may come actually, but the real water requirement comes in the peak summers, that's when the, the glaciers used to contribute. That's going to be, again, the future going to be not so good. And if you look at the energy generations, actually, from this, uh, there's a huge potential. Like, in fact, China has already exploited nearly 90% of all these large rivers which comes of this uh, the region. India is now very fast trying to uh, this one, but there are a lot of env environmental concerns. because, In fact, China had also had a lot of environmental concerns. They didn't care about it. But they, they do have problem now. It's not they don't have problem. So we also have, you must have heard actually many like Chamoli disaster happened last year and all were some of this, uh, you know, hydroelectricity power generations being happening. That's going to be there <coughs> because, however, that's also one of the major, as we want to reduce the carbon footprint, reduce the, the coal-based, uh, you know, energy, what you call power generation, we will also have to look at this kind of hydroelectricity power. But wherein actually this happened, it so happens to be in Himalaya, such a place very, very environmentally, very, very, very critical as a well, vulnerable region. So there are a lot of uh, pot potential as well as difficulties as far as this energy generation is concerned. So now coming few slides, I would just like to tell you about what is happening to these regions because of the warming globe. <coughs> I given a picture of Antarctica here actually as well as the another one actually from Arctic. Two are basically telling stories. One in case of penguins stranded on an iceberg, uh, what, iceberg which got uh, detached from the Antarctic continent. And the other one actually a, a polar bear, or the largest mam, one of the largest heavy, very strong mammal in that area, are struggling because of the loss of sea ice. Because they are huge animals, requires a very stable surface for the hunting, hunting and getting, you know, feeding themselves. Now they have a problem because actually as the, this, this uh, sea ice is getting reduced and thinner, they get thinner, the moment it's thinner actually they, the, such a heavy weight cannot, uh, you know, do hunting on that. And also, <coughs> these, uh, you know, as these things are warming and they're changing, actually, their, you know, their, their lifestyles are going to be different, and the effect is going to be different. 
One picture actually, the two, in fact, two pictures which I shown here actually, this is very recent. In the March, 18th of March, 2022, almost all newspapers carried actually the picture of this, uh, some of this Antarctica. Antarctica getting warmer by nearly one particular day, 40 degrees Celsius increase. Just can you imagine? A country, the place which was it, where it was measured somewhere in the East Antarctica, that's a, that's a time in fact peak of almost peak of close to winter actually, getting closer to winter. Temperature should have been minus 60 degree, that the temperature become minus 10 degree. It is still minus, but it's so warm, 40 degree difference happening just in one day. Same time, Arctic also had a similar thing. In fact, Arctic is going through another heat wave, sorry, the entire Europe is going through another heat wave. You must have heard actually, like people, places like UK are not going to a huge heat wave. And this is something which we are already, this, you know, the place like Kerala is experienced. We know that actually the extremes are happening so fast and, you know, which we never realized actually can happen so fast. <clears throat> Our rains are getting erratic. We get rains, you know, a rain which should happen in a week or month actually happens in one day. Then you have completely dry days. Uh, rains happening actually during, uh, you know, off seasons, so not exactly when the, we should be actually doing affecting the agriculture, affecting the, you know, the entire uh, the lives of people and so on. Same thing is basically happening in the rest of the world. And Antarctica or Arctic is not immune to it. So, all this actually are basically changing so rapidly, unless we really understand these actually, we will never be able to in future, you know, try to model them or predict them in a better way. That's the reason actually why we should be even studying them even more at this time. Okay, this, uh, you know, this was a video actually which was basically moving from, you know, here to here. That doesn't work, actually doesn't matter. The, the message here is actually the, some of the, you know, we are now very well aware the Antarctic ice mass is lost so much actually. In fact, the West Antarctica, the, when you hear about uh, loss of ice mass, different places could be different. It's as simple as if it rains in a place like Kerala, it need not be raining in the place like Himalaya. And now here we are talking about a continent which is about five times of India. So then what happens in one part of Antarctica need not be the same. Like East Antarctica is actually accumulating more ice sometimes than actually seeing the signs of warming. But West Antarctica is losing mass. All these have their own reasons actually, which I would not get details here actually. If you want, I can still discuss that. One reason why West Antarctica is losing more, more mass is basically because if you look at this picture, you see the blue colored ones are nothing but they are ice shelves. Ice shelves are nothing but a floating ice. Like the Antarctic, what you see here is actually actual ice sitting on a land, which is what I call grounded. What you see here actually is that when these ice start flowing towards the ocean because of the gravity, because there is so much ice accumulating and because of gravity start moving. And when it starts moving and reaches the ocean actually, because ice is lighter than the sea water, it starts floating over it. And the floating ice, what we call as ice shells. And the one which actually get detached, we call them as icebergs. And this large ice we call actually as ice sheet. So these are different terms. And what is the simple ice, which uh, what we call surrounding that we call actually sea ice, which is nothing but water frozen, sea water frozen. So what explain this actually because West Antarctica has a large amount of ice shelves which are nothing but uh, bodies of ice floating below there is water sea water and top there is atmosphere as the globe is warming there's not only the solar radiation falling from the top which is making the ice warmer and melting but also the sea water is warmer it is eroding from the bottom this is one reason actually why we are losing large pieces of chunks of this ice into the ocean so it's a double-edged sword so, <laughs> this one reason actually sometimes you hear like for example 2017 we lost a huge amount of a trillion ton iceberg. It was very popular in the, new, in the news media and uh, newspapers and so on. Such a huge ice shelf can be lost because of this particular process which I was talking about. So these are something actually we are hearing of late too much. And uh, it's possible that actually, as we hear in, in coming decades, you will hear this quite often. <coughs> and what do this ice have uh, impact on the, uh, the sea level? As I said, actually, this both uh, Antarctica and Arctic contribute to the huge amount of sea level. Some of you may be aware, sea level is not only contributed by melting ice. One of the biggest culprit of 
increasing sea level is what we call actually thermal expansion of ocean. Ocean being at 70 percent of the global earth surface, any change in uh, the expansion of this, uh, the ocean can it's also lead to sea level increase. Because ocean is getting warmer, so it automatically thermal expansion happens. So this red line what you see actually is basically of the thermal expansion. But if you see from 2010 onwards or even, even much before that, actually much big above this thermal expansion. That is essentially due to the contribution from Antarctica and Arctic. So whenever you think about the sea level, remember that it's not only one culprit, there are multiple things and you, unless until you know what contributes to how much and where, you will again will not really understand uh, than beyond what we just re read in the newspapers. Essentially because I am telling this much more detail because as a student, you should always try to read between the lines. Most of the time media try to hype things. There will be message because they want to convey that, but while conveying that message, it's also important to understand the differences. What you talk about, okay, you know, the ice is melting means ice is not melting everywhere and uh, the sea level is everything is not because of the ice, but ice is a major contributor happening in the off -lane. And it's going to increase. Like uh, if you look at the past two decades, the Greenland is a main culprit of contributing to sea level. And in the coming next decades and other decades going to be Antarctica because Antarctica is getting warmer only now. And the Antarctica getting warmer is a dangerous thing because actually it's a larger ice, much larger ice. So that's what the problem is. And what are the changes, you know, affecting the life? For example, one model actually projected population of, uh, the, you know, for example, penguin population in this case, especially the embered penguins. They're going to be almost bring of extinction, that's the model suggests, based on the current available data as well as the projection actually on the model simulations. By 2050 or so, if you have an increase, the estimated increase about 4 degrees Celsius or something extra, you can have a completely, you know, there, be, there, there may be only in few places left out. That's going to be the difficult, diff different uh, life going to be. <coughs> have you heard actually, you know, we always talk about rivers. When we talk about, did you ever hear there's something called, atmo you know, in the atmosphere also there are such huge rivers. That's what, like for example, you heard actually that last March, in East Antarctica is getting warmer by 40 degrees Celsius. How it's possible? It cannot be just possible in one day. What happened is a huge uh, air system from the tropics to sub, from tro subtropics to polar region moved within one, two days actually, what we call actually say atmospheric river, which is nothing but long narrow jet streams that carry huge amount of water, moisture, as well as it's warmer. Such warm moist air reaches the polar regions, automatically precipitation starts as well as its area become warmer. This is something going to be much more common these days. It's already started becoming common and due to the, you know, the, they're essentially again have a component of the what man-made problems like for example, the basically it happened because of the, the polar vortex has reduced because of the ozone depletion in the past. Ozone is not depleted so much these days, but it was in the past it's so much depleted. So the entire weather system moved uh, around Antarctica and increased greenhouse gas emissions. All this made actually this uh, sea surface temperature increased. So the availability of moisture increased, the temperature increased. As a result, there's a change in the circulation pattern happening over the atmosphere, bringing such large moist as well warm air to Antarctica. And therefore, in future, we're going to expect actually more and more uh, atmospheric rivers reaching Antarctica because of this uh, warmer conditions. So that's going to be again a very lot of problem for in coming days for the Antarctica, which we never know how Antarctica is going to behave in future in such kind of conditions. Arctic, if you look at, Arctic has been always warming nearly three times more than rest of the world. We call them actually as Arctic amplification. That's one thing which you have seen. Entire land which is frozen is no longer getting so much frozen. The where there was hardly any life like tundra and so on. Now there is a, you know this uh, shrubs and other things are growing up actually faster. And sea ice is decreasing. All these are what we call it because of the uh, polar amplification or Arctic amplification, which is nothing but a kind of a feedback mechanism. As the ice start melting, as I said, actually ice is about 80 percent reflecting and uh, only 20 percent absorbing. When it starts slightly melting, you have this water. Water becomes 90 percent absorbing and only 10 percent reflecting. So this local small small pools start happening. 
they, there is a kind of feedback mechanism as slowly start melting because start more absorbing start melting more and so on it's a continuous process happening that's why this region is getting warmer and warmer and there are many other factors associated with that so that details I'm not telling now but again that's another area of research so as I said actually Arctic ice has been decreasing very dramatically it's some of our in fact our study from the our Institute actually where it shows actually there is a relationship even between this uh, the, low, the what you call melting of an Arctic sea ice and Indian late Indian summer monsoon rainfall for example the month month of uh, August or say the retrieving time uh, the ret yeah so that's that's the time actually is getting affected now because Arctic ice is going to be affect even Indian monsoons it's just one study actually <coughs> I'm getting to Himalayas now I hope I'm not overrunning my time I did a little bit I know that because I was trying to explain which I was normally used to rush in Himalayas, I said actually glaciers are melting, which most of us hear anyway. But they are melting so fast since 1980s. If you look at the red line, what shows the, the cumulative, the loss of, uh, you know, the change in the mass of these glaciers. As, you know, uh, glaciers normally get, there are two things happens. One is accumulation because of snow precipitation. And there is something called ablation, which is melting or the loss of ice. As getting warmer and warmer, this ablation happens more, therefore you lose uh, the ice mass much higher. But that's not only one thing, this is a, this is a crucial theme of my, uh, you know, this particular, uh, what it called talk. As the glaciers are melting, they are also becoming more hazardous. Why? As the glaciers start melting, they start forming these small lakes. Nothing but actually it's, uh, you know, these uh, glaciers when they start melting, they used to, the area which they are occupying become a small pond. This pond expands becoming a small lake. The lake expands to become a huge lake. Remember, all these lakes, such a huge lakes are, have only a natural dam. Means the, it's dammed, not by something like a dam which we see. They are not strong enough. They are built by the material brought by these glaciers, transported by the glaciers. And anytime they can breach if something really happens wrong. Like, suppose a glacier already forms a lake and then in the future again some calving happens or sometimes a cloud burst for example cloud burst which burns so much rainfall just comes one the entire thing can just break this is what we often hear actually these days <coughs> there was a nice movie which actually I had to remove it I could not get it and we are seeing almost year after year these kind of disasters happening in Himalayas for example 2013 Kedarnath disaster which so happened actually because actually that Mandagini river were in actually which brings to the, the, the water through along this Kedar. In fact, uh, Kedarnath itself is actually on a flood plain sort of thing place. So what happens actually as things are changing, all these areas where we are occupied actually like even what we see like even the you know, flood season happens in Kerala, what is getting really affected people actually on the rivers because we never expected them the rivers to breach and now we are in a situation where actually suddenly we realize okay our homes also get uh, you know affected <coughs> recently chamoli disaster for example is all you know within a fraction of some hours everything has just got uh, washed away and this is actually was due to a multiple factors like you know the, the frozen land permafrost what we call actually was actually thawing these days and there was a cracks happening into the land itself then there was a huge snowfall on one day so the heaviness everything is just entire land got you know the, the frozen land start falling down what we call actually as a <coughs> avalanche so that avalanche along with this ice water snow everything actually got mixed up actually in a slurry it uh, you know washed away uh, down down you know downstream everything so this is something going to happen more or more and often this is what you have to remember because retreat of glaciers in high mountain Asia like for example Himalaya is going to be you know already we are seeing signs of them actually increasing hazards of landslides so it's are of course it will be increasing because the the frozen land is uh, warming on top of top of that we are also man is make uh, doing a lot of activities on these areas so what we see everything is not natural and everything is not man-made that's what again you have to remember now I come to an area where actually what I just wanted to for the, the younger essentially for the younger gen generation actually to tell you what exactly is India is doing in polar regions 
that there is an institute called the National Center for Polar and Ocean Research from where I come from, which creates a lot of activities in Antarctica with multiple stations, activities in the Arctic and the entire Southern Ocean and Arctic Ocean. Antarctica, we, have, we, we were all, as back in 1981, we started our expedition. It's more than 40 years now. We built our first station called Dakshin Gangotri in 1983. Unfortunately, we were new to the Antarctica <coughs> and we were not experienced, so we built a station on floating ice shelf. So ice shelf, as I said, actually is basically floating. They are very dynamic and they can also start melting faster. So we lost that station within five years. Thereafter, we moved to a place where it's a little bit, you know, Antarctica also has place land which is not fully covered with ice. So these actually, so the, the, that's why what we call actually that, uh, you know, ice-free areas are the best place for the stations. Most of the stations are built on that areas because they're more stable. The Maitri since 1989 is still continuing. And we built a very most modern station actually in somewhere in 2012. It took three years for us to build that. So these are the things what India is doing in Antarctica. And remember those two stations, we're talking about two stations, Maitri and Bharati existing are separated by nearly more than 2,000 kilometer by air and 3,000 kilometer by uh, the sea, sea route. So Antarctica is being huge. You should remember actually you have two stations. Why do you require two stations? They are completely in different areas. This is how Antarctic expedition is being held. In the past, we used to travel by ship all the way from starting from Goa and to reach here, which used to take one month. In fact, I have traveled by ship which exactly takes one month with a small, you know, you know refueling at uh, Mauritius. Since uh, late 90s or at least 2000, actually, we started some air operations. Before, earlier, we used to go to uh, air by South Africa or Cape Town, and from there, we used to go by ship. Now, there are also flights going to Antarctica all the way. So, researchers, <coughs> unlike in the past, the biggest problem for a very serious scientific researcher in the past in Antarctica was actually that he has to really spend at least five months completely away from home to do carry out some experiment or sometimes it can be 15 months because you can go to start of the summer Antarctic summer is actually like our winter time like somewhere in November it starts or December and uh, that's the southern hemisphere uh, uh, summer and by, by March you should come back because by the time the darkness starts the weather completely changes becomes very severe ice become more thicker around the Antarctica, so ships cannot approach. So after that, if you are left out, you can only come back next year. So that's the kind of way it used to be now. Now Antarctica, at least people have an opportunity, at least you can even plan a proposal, project proposal for just for one month, if you have, you have very well planned it well. <coughs> However, you have to remember, going by flight to Antarctica does not mean it's like going from, from here to like Delhi or even to Europe for that matter. The time will be similar for going from uh, Cape Town to Antarctica it takes about eight hours as much as actually it takes typically for an uh, international travel or even sometimes even less than that. However, there are cases our uh, expedition teams have been waiting in Cape Town for 10 days just to get a clear weather window. So you are going to Antarctica not depending on availability of flight. It also depends on the weather in Antarctica at that time. It can be very severe, you know, storms in Antarctica have lots of storms like that. So then you cannot uh, do anything. So sometimes actually, it, you know, many of the senior, <coughs> like even uh, we had a couple of ministerial visit actually. So they all basically are very thrilled to go, but the moment they realize this problem, like for example, sometimes our secretaries or joint secretaries get stuck in Cape Town for 10 days, made them realize it's not just like having a flight and go to Antarctica is not, uh, you cannot just uh, go. So that's the situation. This is just a short movie just showing actually that uh, how do the, the ship approaches Antarctica. You can <coughs> see actually as they go actually you can also see some of the seals moving around. So uh, because the seals are very common you find them close to the coast. Uh, this, this, is an, this is an ice thickened vessel which means actually it can actually break some amount of ice but not necessarily actually cannot uh, with large thick ice for which you require an ice breakers. Yeah, this is something actually like when the fly, through flight when you land in Antarctica, just it, they land on ice. And we have a situation sometimes like this year, last year we had a situation actually because COVID restrictions, we had no, we had a lot of difficulties actually to, 
go less people actually so we use the small flight actually we can without even preparing the land you can sometimes land there is a amount of risk actually but that's how it is antarctic research is taken up so these are the stations how they look like in antarctica as i said actually it has a capacity about uh, 25 people to live in this winter winter we only live within this particular uh, building what are the summer team which is basically the scientific researchers they live in this some of the huts down the side they don't live in the main station and at bharati again actually about uh, winter 17 people and uh, summer time it can be much bigger main research community or research scientists go during the summer time remember that because winter time is so dark it's so cold you can't move outside so that doesn't make any you know you can't carry out many of your experiments you will be having you know in my mind how do we travel over antarctica this is one example actually we use the tracked vehicles which actually which is the main uh, transport within antarctica we have very few, you know powerful machines and also they very safe <coughs> with a small crevasse because antarctic ice can be very treacherous it looks so white everywhere but beware actually there could be a lot of cracks in between you never know it because actually they could be just covered with a thin layer of snow on top you won't realize because the night there must have been some snowfall next day when you go you everything looks so white you start running you could be into a deep uh, crevasse that's why you require these kind of vehicles and also they always go like army you know convoys because there should be always uh, in the antarctica the rule is you should never go alone even as a person if you are walking around there should be a buddy with you the buddy system is the most important because something goes wrong there should be another person to either take care or get the support <coughs> like we got stuck up many times this vehicle can go get into problem also but the speed of course in antarctica you don't worry about your speed the, the fastest speed about this vehicles are 10 km per hour so we travel about 200 300 km it can takes a day sometimes so but uh, that's how the life is and it can be also very challenging to live in uh, if, uh, antarctica many things can go wrong unlike what we think <coughs> come to arctic as i said actually we are i did not say actually that in fact arctic we are in basically in a region called svalbard svalbard is actually a territory of currently a territory political territory of norway but as per the antarctic arctic treaty sorry svalbard treaty any countries can go there and carry out research there is no separate permission required and this is the what but however actually they are all kept in one place to ensure that there is no environmental damage so a lot of countries have small 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 stations in one place then they move move around actually for their actual camping outside this is a small station which we have actually himadri we can't build things there we can only take help of the you know the norwegian uh, you know what do you call authorities and uh, you know you know rent some places this is what it look like unlike antarctica this is one of the la few last slides actually arctic has become so important geopolitically india has came with its own policy arctic policy which is a long pending should have been done much before in fact actually that really happened finally we have an arctic policy <coughs> which basically rests on six pillars science and research is the main thing because that's also the face to the world we of course have interest in understanding climate and environmental protection but we also have interest in actually economic and human deployment we have interest in connectivity in future the transportation and connectivity and the governance of international you know cooperation because as the arctic is going to be completely different than what we see today the governance going to be a big question mark there are big sharks already sitting the countries like china already just uh, trying to you know do put their influence there so it's important for any you know big governments to look into that and of course for national capacity building these are one of the areas actually where arctic policy is going to unlike the uh the chinese uh, arctic policy which states actually they consider actually as themselves a near arctic country basically it's not a arctic country what they said we are near arctic means when we the connection happens actually because of this uh, sea ice uh, you know disappearance we will also become sort of close to arctic line so that's a kind of geopolitical games going on in arctic so but we are not uh, getting the, the government of india says no our interest is essentially on basically on scientific research and uh, maybe of course in future as it happens <coughs> finally just again for this is for the men for students can you just click that because i cannot click it from here that my experience in poland so basically i just want to give you one minute before that 
this one picture actually which shows, so shows that actually no problem let's go ahead no no you have to click that click that my experience yeah say it okay so okay no it doesn't work it won't work in the screen this screen so pointers doesn't work yeah this is just an example actually some of the expeditions we take up uh, this one example for one of Indo Norwegian project actually which we just concluded last year in fact we started to do the big, bigger project this year with the Indo UK Norwegian project this is how it look like this is all I made it a small capsule less than five minutes to because not to get bored actually these are the vehicles we use you can see them moving fast, they don't really move fast, okay, that's only for the movie. These are the kind of, uh, you know, things we have to carry. When you go to Antarctica, you have to plan in such a way that even from a pin to anything what you require, you need to carry. Because if you miss it, you will not be able to do anything. This is something actually I was telling the crevasses. You know, you never see them unless you have a proper equipments. Once you have it, if you still want to cross them, we all sometimes even fill them with a lot of snow. It, take, it can take several days just to fill the some you know gap. Then we set up the camps. This is how it actually fast moving movie look like actually. So we set up camps which can last for one month, sometimes even more than that. Without, don't imagine about having a proper communication. Don't imagine take thinking about having bath bath twice in a day actually. No, absolutely no, nothing to come back to your station. This is completely out of that place. You have no chance of that. <coughs> And most of the time, we also even work during night time because the, it's uh, summer time, light is always there. And in fact, most of the time, we prefer to work in night time and night is slightly less warmer because summer, summer the daytime can be really, the solar radiation is so high, we all become darkened and then it's also start melting sometimes. These are the tents we set up. We have to generate our own power if you have to operate instruments, you have to you carry this uh, diesel generators actually. So sometimes they don't work well, they have problems. So you need to be a, a porter to a boss. Everything you have to do yourself. You have to be a technician sometimes, you have to do everything, you have to carry things. So there are no other people to help you. This is one of the work which we carry out. So which now we have, we have become much more sophisticated, we have a now better uh, system. This was starting long back. But this is a night time, night time it looked like, you can see the sun just moving around in the circle. That's a typically midnight suns actually, you know, you will see around the, because you are on the pole, already close to the pole. So now we have slightly more protection, earlier we didn't have protection, so therefore actually the wind, strong winds comes actually, we have to stop the work. Now we do it in a little more sophisticated way where we have much more better facilities. But even then it will be cold inside, but you can, you will get protected from the wind. This is basically drilling, I, I'm, I'm not getting into details here because anybody have doubt, I'll tell you, because why do we do this actually, it's a, it's a completely different area of uh, research which I, I could tell later on. Basically, we want to reconstruct the climate because of the, the kind of Antarctic ice is nothing but actually the, uh, the snow get deposited and that snow carries everything in the atmosphere and Antarctic climate records are only about few years and we, if you want to have long term climate records, we need to, we can use the ice as a climate, uh, you know, sensor. Operating these machines in cold is not a very easy thing, you know. There are some pictures actually where actually, you know, your, your hands will be burned and all because cold burn is something very common in this, you know, it can be so cold and metal start get, uh, you know, stay. so without gloves you can't do, operate it. You know, tools while operating with uh, gloves also not possible properly, you would need to have uh, your own hand. So in between you remove the, this one quickly and try it and it can get again, uh, you know, problem. So, yeah, things can be a bit uh, difficult. That's how it is. It looks like more like Puttale. If you come to Goa, there is an ice core laboratory which, uh, you know, which I was uh, in, in a, involved from the very beginning to create. We have this facility which is maintained at minus 20 degree. Where all this ice you can see and also where we have uh, you know, facilities to do analysis of these instruments and so on. This is surveying actually like in ice. You should know actually, you know, what, what, what is happening, like for example, I was talking about ice shelf can be lost after some time. How do you know it? 
we have to measure what's happening on the ice on the top as well as on the bottom so we use specialized equipments like uh, autonomous phase sensitivity radars and so on which we install in one place and go and next year we find out actually how much actually melting has happened so there is a lot of such works going goes on in antarctic field when you go and remember i see a lot of girls here we also have you know the the ladies comes to this for expeditions uh, sometimes many girls in fact who are just completed the masters and doing phd's and so on so that was just a project you can just close it now yeah so just this picture actually just once we are, we also had happen to be in once to uh, south pole as i said the geographic south pole that's the only time we had actually which has taken about uh, two months of tra you know, traveling over the ice it's a pretty uh, what i call very challenging because of actually the uh, the temperature around the antarctic uh, coast t temperatures are nearly warm warm in the sense summer time can be even minus 5 degree or winter can be minus 30 degree whereas as you close to antarctic and the higher you know, up in the mountains the temperature can be minus 60 degree even during summer time so that can be as cold as that so that's why it is more challenging so this is our work in himalaya we have set up a lot of observation systems in, uh, in himalayan glaciers up in ladakh in uh, himachal pradesh sikkim and so on that's also the some of our work in arctic finally just for your students this is the last slide in fact i just created made it actually when i was sitting there in uh, our pvc's uh, office i just want you to get interested in some science after you have uh, your plus 2 and you are looking for doing uh, continuing if you are not getting into a, a, what is called uh, engineering or medicine and so on science is something if your interest is actually earth science is something takes you to places i'll tell you that i think that it has taken me to places i have seen the all continent and almost all countries because of my association with earth science i started my research my studies in geology land geology moved to oceans marine science after some time i did my phd and my postdoc everything in uh, in oceans in 2002 i completely shifted to ice now we don't like to do it actually once you do a phd you like to continue everything that but i had an opportunity because of the, the new institute created and also it was a challenge so it so happened i completely i left ocean and then went to the ice what we call what we call cryosphere but that's helped me a lot if i look back that was a big change which a big shift i made and that too after having another job i shifted that it was very looking back actually if it is now i wouldn't do it because that was when you are young you do many things so that's why i'm telling you people when you are young is the time to think about difference make a difference rather than actually thinking about uh, just following the routines and if you are good enough because just thinking of doing is a one thing working for is a different thing work very hard as if your life depend on it that makes a difference and choose so what i call mentors who are the real top people who will ensure that actually you are guided in the right way rather than actually you start uh, you know start moving like also ran sort of thing so try to if you want to do research that would be a great way even without research earth science provide an opportunities of jobs plenty of jobs actually in petroleum industries and uh, other oceanography and other so on so i just want to say here a journey of a thousand miles miles just begins with one step i made that one step actually uh, two you know two times actually once taking research in oceanography then i was completely leaving that actually and stepping into another field so that that step actually now you look back that time you don't realize it you think okay i will try to do something i will try this one but if you really work hard you may reach a place not necessarily everyone reach that place but if you work hard if you are sincere if you are you know really put your efforts into it you are surely will be there somewhere so that you know step makes a huge difference i think uh, as a students i want you to tell you that this is also time to think rather than just following what others are telling you thank you so much with that i stop you ladies and gentlemen the session is now open for discussion we request our students do not hesitate please yeah, come forward please do not hesitate and please think about language as barrier i can very well speak in uh, reply in malayalam also at least and i can very well understand anyway those who wish to speak please raise your hand i'll come to you 
Yeah, use a mic, please. And just like, uh, tell your name and you can just if it is, tell your school also, it'll be your school or college or place or whatever it is also be nice. At least yes, tell sir. your name. We'll start with a very young participant from Chinmaya Vidya. Perfect. As the Arctic ice starts melting, are research outposts in danger? Uh, no. It could be if you are in a place, in such a, if you are put in, for example, if you are stationed on North Pole, North Pole is basically just sea water frozen, the ice, sea ice, then it could be a problem. But there are no stations in North Pole. We are on a land. You may need multiple mics so that uh, one person running around will be a problem. Good morning, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'm from Geography Department. Oh. I'm from Geography Department. So you have uh, recently told about uh, how the ice are melting, but uh, recently there was an article published where we have pollution levels are also increasing in Antarctica. I think recently, while they were collecting samples, they have found pieces of microplastics, microplastics. in every samplings. Yes. So, uh, do you think that these kind of expeditions are really uh, the disturbing the balance in the ecosystem happening there? Do you think that? Good question. Uh, okay, uh, there are two uh, two answers to it. The first one, actually, the microplastics what we see around Antarctica are not actually produced in Antarctica because of the what we deposit in the in the ocean travels all around the world, so it reaches to even Antarctica because of the currents are so powerful. But if you are talking about actually the what on the Antarctic ice, sometimes you find it, it can be basically partly due to the what you call these local stations actually. But however, there is a strict, stringent rules on Antarctic protocol, sorry, as for the Antarctic protocol on the environmental degradation. Since last at least two decades, that strictly followed. However, the early explorers left a lot of things there. That still, you know, flies around. They can be one source. Another source, most of the dust particle reaching Antarctica are coming from other continents. Because of such a strong wind, and also Antarctica being so pristine, whatever comes actually from other continents get deposited here. And remember the microplastics which you have must have read in paper, they are extremely so low level for a people like us. Because Antarctica, it was a first time report, it got a lot of new media attention. So, if you ask me, locally there can be minor impact on the environment. Like, I am talking about a, such a large area, your station can be one pin there. So, around that pin, there could be little areas will be you know disturbed, <coughs> but that disturbance is uh, what you call manage or means uh, some way helps to understand that place better. So you have you make some problem, but that problem also with a very minimal. Like for example, I'll tell you a simple example. Even when we I go for this kind of camping outside, okay, of course we won't have toilets and all, but we are supposed to carry collect all human waste, including human waste bring back to station and incinerate. After incineration, we bring the ash all the way to Goa earlier. Now we bring to Cape Town and then dispose it out. So basically a lot of care is taken actually what you then imagine. It's much more than actually what you see in uh, normal places. Sir, Gayatri Pradeep from Chinmaya. Uh, sir, I have to ask something regarding uh, expeditions in general. Right. I have heard that in the Antarctic, you're, it's so cold that your breath freezes under your nose. So, sir, uh, regarding to su survive in the Antarctic, even for that short five months period, sir, you will certainly need some support, right? Uh, maintain body and all that. What support you're talking about, uh, Gayatri? Uh, no, sir. Like, I know that uh, you're in clothes. Yeah, 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 okay. Like you, okay. When, like, uh, when you are in Rome, being a Roman, like, if you are in Antarctica, you be a, act like an Antarctican because you have to protect yourself. Safety is the first norm whenever you go to Antarctica. You need to have proper clothing, like uh, sometimes, like for example, uh, when we go to South Pole, actually we had five layers, not one or two, three. There are multiple layers <coughs> to ensure that actually there is a sufficient uh, insulation in between. Having uh, one thick cloth is not sufficient sometimes. You have multiple layers which ensure that uh, air get, uh, you know, but still your some part will be exposed. Like some of my, you know, pictures from Antarctica clearly shows actually I have big burns on the nose. Sometimes, uh, you know, you can have this blue fingers and so on. That's possible. 
But what is important actually that you constantly take care of yourself. There's nobody going to be there. We will have a doctor in the station, but when we go to the field like this, we won't have it. So we take, like for example, one thing you have to be very careful in Antarctica. When you work hard, you will sweat because your body automatically sweats. Outside is so cold that the sweat can immediately freeze. And that that for the what uh, that freeze actually is you know in your, especially your legs and this one will be very dangerous because after some time actually like uh, your frostbite will start. So what we do actually we always carry a lot of socks even in the cold. Just remove it and try to re use a new socks so that uh, you, there should not be that. Those are the areas you should be very careful. You need to imagine there's going to be problem. So how do I take care of it? Hi sir, uh, my name is Ranish from the Department of Physical Education. So my question, uh, uh, I've read in a newspaper that five of the cities in India that might go under water by 2030, which includes Kochi, Mumbai, Kolkata and Katak. Uh, so what is your take on that? Will it really happen? Yeah, that 2030 is too far fetched actually, but uh, it's, it could be problematic for many cities actually on the sea level, currently sitting in the sea level, by at least by 2100. Uh, but also you should remember the technology is also slightly improving. So things can be, may not be exactly as we imagine now. People have to, like already you must have seen some lot of changes are happening and all. But it's going to be affected. That's why let me pay, say sure, if not uh, my generation, your generation may see it. Or the, the their generation may see it. There are going to be problem, at least the very, co very much coastal areas actually could be affected. Not the entire cities or something, but the uh, place is going to be affected. I don't find anything from college students. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, uh, sir my name is Hari Krishnan. Yes, I'm Hari. doing my post graduation in uh, Kanu University, Department of Zoology, MSc Applied Zoology. Sir, is there any chance of spreading novel pathogens uh, that, that are trapped in uh, ice, uh, uh, to uh, melting of uh, Antarctic ice? Excellent question. Uh, basically, I think I, I'm, I'm pleased that you asked this question. As the uh, ice is getting warmer and also this, the permafrost, for, for example, land, frozen land start uh, you know, warming, there's a chance of a lot of this uh, virus and uh, the bacteria actually are basically, you know, which were actually frozen inside and then uh, they could be actually coming up. This is one area of research, in fact, actually. There's one complete area of uh, research actually or the, the new upcoming possibilities of new virus and other things coming out of this, uh, you know, warming glaciers and especially warming land. The land is much more problematic than the ice itself because there are opportunities of a life already thriving there already, which may have been just uh, locked. And unlocking this, how do it will be in behave in future? We really not, do not know. That's a fact. Good morning, sir. My name is Hridya. Uh, I am hey, doing can my master's. Show the hand? Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. I am doing my master's in zoology, Kanur University campus, Mandawadi. Uh, sir, if we are interested in doing this in Antarctica, uh, is there any permissions for that? And I also heard about uh, they test physical conditions of people like health conditions yeah, your first drunk. question let me understand you are asking whether as a student you have an opportunities or you are asking for anyone else you are asking the mic is sometimes a problem uh, yes i am asking all right yeah in fact there was a scheme for some time back actually for the only exclusively for students master students actually unfortunately we just stopped it recently due to many reasons one is that actually we had an accident of this one student came from iit met with a accident serious accident so which led to a lot of questioning from the government and authorities actually that uh, whether you have followed the norms and all that actually because students are basically can be a little more. So that one reason by the time COVID came, so all entire program was this one. Otherwise, we always had a program for the students. However, even if for a, you are a researcher, like you are doing PhDs, for example, then there is certainly opportunities because you can put up a project or proposal actually Everybody can put up a project proposal to Antarctic expedition. That's the beauty of Antarctic pro program, the national Antarctic program, because it's funded by the government. We are only uh, the, what you call the nodal agency to ensure that the right people and right project goes to these places. 
Sometimes uh, you can be very youngsters. Have, we, have, we have seen multiple times actually very young students actually just uh, starting PhDs and all going to Antarctica and uh, able to do much, much better research. And uh, yeah, it's possible, number one. Then you said actually about the training you required. All people selected undergoes a medical test at All India Institute of Medical Science in Delhi. Very strict medical test. Uh, it takes at least a week minimum. A lot of people get rejected. You, so therefore, actually, it's important actually you remain very fit physically and mentally. Mentally is important actually when you go for winter. The wintering people also go through a you know psychological test just to ensure that what kind of person you are. For example, actually, if you're you're close in this room for one full day or one week or maybe about the entire um, year, how will you behave? That behavior is very important actually is to decide what kind of person you are, or how will you be able to survive in those conditions. So those psychological tests are also important. At least minimum uh, medical test is important. Thereafter, actually, uh, they are sent to uh, you know, Uttarakhand, uh, Oli. There is a ITBP, uh, the India Indo Tibetan Border Police is running an institution for mountaineering and skiing. So they will train you for uh, almost a month, uh, what you call the climbing hills, climbing rocks, and uh, uh, rock techniques, and uh, all kind of other techniques to ensure that actually you know you have the basic skills. And also, to ensure, like for example, this many people sit together in one month, one place, automatically friendships develops. There are, there are small, small, nice groups develop actually about they are comfortable because that is important when you are sent to Antarctica. The people behaves as a cohesive team. Also, when a problem comes, they are come with uh, some solutions. So, that's, that's all happens as part of that particular training. Thank you. Your mic is not... Uh, We are seeing uh, photos here. I can't see any plant species in that photos or videos. Is there any plant species present in I'm not an expert, but I can tell you there are two plant, vascular plant species in the Antarctic Peninsula. Like when I say Antarctic Peninsula, it's always the tip of that Antarctica. Over this. This tip actually, which is already a very warm place. Now, like we look at the tip actually, it is not part of the main Antarctica. It is already at 70 degree or 75 degree, uh, so, sorry, not 75, 60 degree south, which is pretty close to the South American continent. There are some species there. Rest of Antarctica, you have only lichens and mosses. That's the plant species, you know, you can say if you call them as plant species. Both mostly mosses, lichens. Lichens, you find plenty of them. As the land get warmer, actually, they might, the lichens start uh, occupying those areas and so on. Thank you. Sir, my name is Anand. I'm from EVS department, University College, Manga to Okay. My question is, is there any relationship between polar ice and ozone depletion, ozone hole? And yep. uh, the next question is, what are the chemical and mineral composition of polar ice? First question, actually, of course, the, the entire polar, uh, the, uh, the Antarctic ozone hole is first detected in Antarctica. Sorry, the ozone hole is first detected in Antarctica in the 80s. And it's mostly around this area. And that was found to be actually because of this man-made, uh, you know, CFCs and so on. So then there was this Montreal protocol came actually, and then they, we have all decided actually that we will not generate that actually. Since then, actually, the, the ozone hole has been actually recovering. Doesn't mean that that recover will be so fast as actually the, you know, you know that like anything to, to break this building, it takes only an half an hour for you. To make this building will take about some few years for you. It's same thing way. While making that actually, you know, breaking it was easier, but uh, again, bringing back is where it takes, can be 2030 or 2040 can be normal. However, by the time things are again changing, no zone is improving actually. By the time water vapor actually is increasing tremendously because of warming and CO2 is increasing tremendously. Water vapor is a very powerful greenhouse gas and CO2 of course you know it. So again things are not going to be so very nice for uh, Antarctica in coming near future. Second question, what are the composition of the, the ice? Ice is nothing but water molecule. Just H2O. However, there can be also like, uh, it's just like for example you, you keep a bucket and the, when the rains, you get water, it will have of course water in it, H2O in it, there can also be many chemical compounds it, because the, the rain comes through the atmosphere. Atmosphere has a lot of particles in that. Especially you collect the first rain. 
some of them can be very acidic because there is so much actually you know what you call polluted air actually like uh, how, what you called uh, uh, sulfuric acid kind of thing it can be because actually there is so much of hydrogen sulfate on uh, other things and on top so therefore uh, there can be a lot of chemical compounds antarctic ice is much more very pristine than if you are taken ice in himalaya for example himalayan ice can be completely very dirty due to many reasons because actually there is a mountains lot of dust falls into it and also of course we it is a place closer to where we generate dust or generate pollutions okay oh yeah oh sorry okay go ahead, go ahead. sir i am sapna from department of geography kanur university so you did your research in oceanography and you shifted to ice core studies so what were the difficulties you faced while doing that and how did your earlier experience in oceanography helped you in this field right. and as geographers do we have any scope in this ice core studies yeah uh, thanks uh, good question actually so basically uh, i so the, the i started marine geology start a little more into oceanography so the basic techniques in science especially natural science are similar you collect the right kind of sample right kind of data you try to understand the natural process surrounding it then you are able to interpret them with the right tools and right uh, thought process and if you are clever enough but however when i'm talking about ocean i was talking about the process what happening ocean in my entire life till then actually i studied only ocean of ocean currents and ocean process actually biogeochemical cycles and ocean and so on so many things the moment i shifted to ice ice is actually a process actually between atmosphere and the land because whatever it falls from the top therefore i should study meteorology and atmospheric science that was a big challenge actually for my several years whenever i was you know trying to look at the ice i had always think in a different way actually okay this is a different process than actually what i understood earlier therefore that early times can be very difficult and more importantly setting up research facilities for studying ice can be much more challenging unlike you you if at all you have a chance to come to goa visit us i will arrange a visit uh, you see you should see the lab a lot of things which you imagine actually are simple cannot be simple when in that kind of conditions it can be completely wrong i'll tell you a simple example actually in fact uh, i was in one of the uh, that time actually we had a cnn ibn interview actually at the studio so they were asking actually, what are the things you face simple example i'll tell you we take it for granted many things uh, like uh, i'll tell you the, the, i realized the most important earlier we used to always talk about actually that importance of you know food water and shelter these are the main thing actually man want you would only realize that important real value of it when you are in such conditions i realized it that's the time i really realized it and so some for example we were actually trucking actually for a whole day starting from the early morning we don't break in between because we have only one meal in a day there are many reasons one meal in a day because actually you have to put up a shelter it takes time you need to settle down actually and also it's also important actually you your waste should be reduced because there are no proper to you don't have toilets so you have to ensure that actually you do as much as very limit actually you are on intake so that you are able to do in a better way manage yourself so i'll tell you an example first day because that was the first ever experience actually suddenly reaching into 3000 meter altitude and the temperature reaching almost close to minus 30 minus 40 which is summer which is not common in the coastal areas none of our things worked we were we planned very big things we are taken gas cylinders actually to have you know, and its hose pipe was still remain rubber a rubber breaks actually in cold conditions plastic breaks in cold conditions so many things you imagine actually are just routine here will not work there so that's what you realize actually you will only realize when you uh, reach the water for example you will not have actually water unless and you melt the water when you melt water you go you melt snow which has fallen somewhere a clean area we find out actually we decide this is going to be our water source and then we melt that water in there is in in fact there was one video which i did not show here actually where you are melting ice is there actually when you melt this much of snow you will get only this much of water to get one glass of water because density of uh, snow is only about 0.2 to 0.3 whereas water is one so you get only one third of or by one to, you know fourth of actually only you get water so these are the things that you don't realize it you will not realize unless you really do it yourself there are many things like that so i'm just give some examples to it so my name is fizak from dinul islam sabha girls high secondary school so my question is uh, my aim is to become a doctor 
So is there any possibility to f for me to go there and have a... Oh, we have plenty of doctors visiting Antarctica. You know that? Because all expeditions have doctors. Earlier we used to have only one doctor or the, who will also one for winter and summer. Uh, now we have two doctors at least because actually that uh, you know there one can be in problem. So we always have our doctors going into Antarctica. Many of them, I'll tell you, they are very successful doctors making big money. They come because actually they want that you know that life. So they already we pay very less to doctors. We can't pay big salaries because in one thing I should tell you all, science is not for those who want to make money. Okay, if you want to make big money, become a chartered accountant or become something those kind of thing actually make uh, lots of money. But if you are passionate and if you are a want to, you know, if you want to live a different life, a life which you are satisfied, is science is for that. So, uh, in this case, doctors do come actually, very successful people also come with a very low salary just to ensure that that's basically become a, a different experience. For these days, a lot of people actually have money, but they don't have that uh, in experience. So, we get a lot of people actually from that. So, you can always come. You become a doctor, you decide after some time, yes, I want to go to Antarctica. You can also go as a tourist, we got a lot of money, okay? Antarctica is you know, open to tourism these days. So my name is Fatima Farhana. I'm also from the Inul Islam Sabah Girls High, High Secondary School. So I'm curious that what kind of food do you take with, uh, take with you when you go to Antarctica? Good question, very good question. In the past, there used to be very strict uh, you know, norms of food we are taking actually because we used to have this um, food created by this one, uh, you know, food, uh, what do you call, there is a, Mysu, there is an you know, institute actually who are basically researching on food. So they used to make this food for the army, packed ones actually, the packed rotis and all. These days actually a lot of things that comes already in packed, so you can still carry them. More importantly, what you should uh, understand actually, the, there are, when you say to Antarctica, it can mean actually what turn the station or where the people like me go into a field. People like me, when we go to the field, we will have very limited possibilities because we are our, we, we cannot cook things like what you can do in a station where there already every facilities are there. In a station, we have everything from atta to rice and everything actually, so they can cook. There is a cook. Uh, we you know we have a, you know permanently every year we recruit a cook actually, but we should also help the cook. I learned a lot of cooking from Antarctica. Let me tell you, so you learn a lot of things there. So I started making very good uh, chapatis actually after going to Antarctica. So you, you can learn a lot of things actually even, uh, so there will be food, good food made, but there are uh, what you call rations. You don't get anything and everything what you want. You may not get sufficient fruits, you may not get sufficient vegetables. You will have to live just on meat or just uh, some other protein source like dal and other things and all so on. So and then you take vitamin tablets sometimes because you need vitamins actually, you need to take uh, the for tablets. If you are a summer time, if you are lucky, sometimes you get fruits, but you don't get fruits every time. So there are restrictions. Uh, there is a question of eating same food every day comes. All that can be there. But then your, your aim is not just eating food there, isn't it? So just imagine that, then you will be able to uh, live well. My name is Yadashyam. I am from Chennai Vidyalaya. So my question is, uh, like, are there any natural resources there in Antarctica? And my second question is, like, uh, can we find fossils there? Like, uh, had there been any paleontology uh, expeditions? Excellent question, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, first question was actually that uh, natural resources. Antarctica being, uh, as I said, actually Antarctica, India and all work together, isn't it? So every land, whatever nature, natural resource has, even Antarctica will have it. Antarctica, in fact, has been actually reported in the early days of exploration, they reported actually coals and possibilities of petroleum and mineral resources. But unfortunately, since 1959, entire thing has been banned. No exploration possible because actually then people start looking for, then they will start breaking the rules. So no exploration of natural mineral resources actually are being done ever since 1959. So only information available is before that. So you cannot uh, even explore that. But there will be natural resources, no doubt about it. Uh, second question you asked, uh, fossils. Of course, there are plenty of fossils. The same fossils you find in India, you have found. Like for example, uh, like uh, some plant species, Glos Glosopteris, uh, some uh, plant species that actually, which was found in actually in Gondwana time in Indian, especially northern India, you find it. You find them in Antarctica. You are even, the, recently, last year, there was a publication came, uh, wherein people find, uh, found actually what you call uh, the tropical rainforest fossils. 
which means about nine, that was about 90 million years back, almost 100 million. So that, that time, there was, it was as good as a tropical land because it was not close to the South Pole and the entire this, uh, what you call this ice system was not you know, formed at that time in Antarctica. Antarctica was just like any other land some time back. So you would find all those fossils, but buried deep in the ice because ever since Antarctica started uh, forming this ice, the ice is as thick as kilometers long. There are some places four kilometers long. So you will never be able to really get them. You can find them only in small exposed places. I was telling some areas are exposed. Those are the only, only opportunities to get those fossils. But there are fossils. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, many, like the young aspirant doctor had asked whether she can go to the expeditions. Uh, I'm sure uh, when you go for these expeditions, you are studying on the geological aspects. Is there any study done on you people at, as the human at an extreme environment? I, I, I understand that DRDO and DIPAS are working on this. So I yeah. think that can be interesting for some of these oh, students. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there are, of course, there are research going on human physiology and the, you know, psychology. Uh, there has been uh, some research, uh, defense research institute people have been always visiting us actually during as part of uh, in the past uh, many times in the wintering actually. So they look at uh, how the human behavior number one and their physiology for example what happens to them actually during certain times, certain periods actually during the mood swings and uh, issues and other thing and all. How do people actually change through time you know, under those conditions? And uh, sometimes actually the what works in cold conditions and what does not, what works, uh, you know, what does not work here and so on. So there is always a research uh, team component to it. But that's, that's not always. Every year we don't have somebody because you need actually somebody who go ready to go for 14, 15 months. That's because only wintering time you can do this recipe. Then only you will have a full annual cycle of uh, you know, you know, research. Summer time is basically as just the doctors go actually as to support to ensure the health of the well-being of the people and some emergency happens. We had emergencies actually many, many times actually. So maybe sometimes emergency actually. Antarctica even had an operations actually in the past. So you know sometimes you can do it but then the facilities are not so high in an Antarctic station. So the, there are limitations but uh, these kind of studies of, of, you know, quite often is carried out. Sir, sir uh, regarding the research in uh, Antarctica, U.S. and, uh, uh, of course, U.S. are also having rich tradition in research in Antarctica. And India also we have. Uh, and very recently, the investment from China is uh, in a, from a very different dimension they are investing in Antarctica. What can be the geopolitics of China there? Yeah, see, once upon, you see, it's all the global geopolitics decide actually who goes to Antarctica or Arctic. I'll tell you, global geopolitics. When USSR and U.S. were competing actually at the superpowers, the USSR built a series of stations across Antarctica. So many of them actually, had, like for example, when the moment uh, US occupied uh, the South Pole, they went to a fall of uh, what you call the geomagnetic pole actually, so the USSR, and built a station. All this become unmanageable since 1990s actually of the fall of USSR. But uh, some of them are still managed these days actually. Then many other uh, countries took over some of the stations and so on. The recent geopolitic actually, the last 10 years, you see China as a major player. China is a real big elephant in that room. Any of the global geopolitics, including Antarctic and Arctic. They're more interested in Arctic than Antarctic. But however, their investment in Antarctica actually has been millions of dollars. They built uh, multiple stations in the last few five years, five to six years. They started a deep drilling project actually, uh, which will again cost a huge amount of this one. But uh, the beginning they wanted, they were doing in collaboration with the uh, Japanese and others. Then they removed everyone out of it. They, they said they will do themselves. But now, because of the, they don't have expertise, so it's slowed down actually. But however, they, they built a very astronomical lab actually in a, in a place actually which is so inaccessible. So the whole idea is, you know, because this uh, Antarctic Treaty started in 1959. First it was for 50 years. It was extended for another 50 years. By another 2059, that second term is also over. By the time, you don't know how the world is changing. So if somebody wants to take a claim, how do you do it? You, you, have, you should have your footprint. That's, that, in fact, that's how the Indira Gandhi the government decided at that time, actually, why should we go to Antarctica? We should have a footprint to claim something tomorrow. So that's the whole idea. Actually, China is expanding like uh, feverishly. You would uh, see across things. 
they're investing money on almost anything actually they call it science diplomacy in the name science diplomacy in the name of science they put big money but they they have a different geopolitical you know this to it same thing in arctic arctic is more complicated because actually there are um, there are countries already living there so it is unlike antarctica it's not free but their main aim is arctic they built a many uh, ice breaker vessels huge uh, investment they are doing into it billions of dollars I, you know you won't believe with the money which china is pumping into those areas uh, sir my name is rajil joseph i am working at kanur university sir my question is sir recent 22 uh, or 10 to 12 10 to 20 years before we only heard about the cyclone sit in the bay of bengal but recently uh, we heard about uh, the cyclone sit in the arabian arabian sea also sir uh, in your slide uh, we can say that um, the southern ocean is the much more uh, hot in uh, nowadays and is, is it a uh, stimulus for and uh, the, cy the ocean cyclones are hitting in the arabian yeah, ocean yeah you already answered it partly okay in fact uh, it's not my area of expertise but since i am working closely with those people work on this uh, you know things what you must have seen as you rightly said earlier used to be bay of bengal used to be the always problematic cyclone now bay of bengal is calm very nice okay there can be there are fewer cyclones but a heavier what is called more uh, impactful cyclones coming in bay of bengal arabian sea monsoon season never used to have a cyclone now we are getting more and more cyclone essentially because the arabian sea is warmed up that is called the, the, the warming up of this uh, arabian sea happened tremendous last uh, you know 10 uh, 20 years i think almost 2 degree warming so it's a huge uh, warming warming water generates lot of instability it generate lot of moisture This moisture actually is a very dangerous thing actually huge amount of moisture gets and at the same time the instability of ocean makes this turning of this ocean making creating small you know cyclones and then start spinning around that's exactly the reason actually not exactly southern ocean more on the arabian sea the northern indian ocean warming hi sir hi sir i am varna uh, doing masters in biotechnology from chinmay arts and science college and i have heard about uh, a lots of discoveries uh, based on the volcanoes and a number of volcanoes have been already discovered in antarctica and is there any studies and research based on the volcanoes and there uh, is any possibility of volcano eruptions happening in antarctica okay as a biotechnology student i would expect you to look about life actually but then you have a different question eh? interesting question yeah thank you uh, so the volcanoes in antarctica are very few there are volcanoes some areas of uh, western antarctica does have volcanoes actually therefore the uh, areas around them actually very small ones not very uh, as much big as what you find in indonesia and those, those areas there are few so the one we the, the lot of the size start around them you know the, the, the geothermal uh, heat of the land will be higher where the volcano is sir. therefore there will be less there won't be any ice left there so there are few but uh, the none of them are major explosive in nature so the you don't find them or for actually uh, you know creating as a long term problem for the you know antarctica itself but they are very interesting because there are a lot of life associated with this volcanoes volcanic things you know you must be there are some they live they they have the nutrients because volcanoes provide lot of mineral nutrients the nutrients are uptake you know by this uh, organisms actually they there are specific specific species living around them so they can be an area of applied research there. looking at those organisms actually living in those areas and what do they do how do they do it what are their potential as in a bio, for example biotechnological applications for example yes very interesting hello sir my name is shreya from chinmaya college go ahead sir can hear you and i am doing masters in biotechnology so my question is as you said that there are a lot of plenty of lichens which is present in the antarctica and we know that lichens they are extremely extreme maybe say holding the mic is let maybe problem i don't know maybe some technical problem go ahead no problem i can hear it. sir uh, my question is that, uh, like you said the lichens are present No problem. Just remove your mask and talk. I can hear you there. I can hear you.
Right. Shreya, I want to, we should remember actually that we have microplastics and much more plastics around here. We don't have lichens and mosses actually in our land. They would survive when uh, basically they may adapt themselves in a different way. There may be some genetic differences actually, I don't know, but they will be always there. Antarctica, believe me, I'm telling from my own experience as well as knowledge actually that Antarctica is the most pristine place anywhere else in the world. What you hear is uh, because even then minute pollution comes, so therefore it becomes a news, therefore it becomes a research paper, therefore it becomes a media attention. Does not mean it is it's polluted. No, it is not polluted, but there are some presence started coming. They have only presence. Second to your question, I think the virus thing. Again, the viral things actually in what in Antarctica, we do not know in future. As of now, there is no major things reported. Arctic, there are some few of them reported. But again, remember actually the kind of virus you have already in other places, maybe the virus, viral load could be much higher. But there could be specific uh, species or these things actually which may come up out of it which nobody knows. There are research only going on it. What are the potential different viral things you can get compared to what you have already available? Like you must have seen a lot of things, new things coming off late. We, we never know. For which you don't have to go to Antarctica or Arctic itself. It can happen here itself. Hmm? So Antarctica is still the safest place for you to come and work and uh, carry out your science. OK? Yeah, Antarctica has uh, plenty of uh, don'ts than do's. You can't do many things. So uh, any time go in the first time make a lot of mistakes, therefore he does not come with good results because he has not been mentored very well or guided very well. You, can, you cannot do many things what you plan to do here. Therefore you need to know the limitations first, plan a research accordingly, then come out with solutions actually to avoid that limitations. So that happens typically with a little more uh, what you call progression of experience. Also, you are remember actually that India is not a very real polar country. Therefore, our experience in polar research has been limited. Only of late actually there have been some amount of expertise have been developed. So there will be always trial and error method, experience by fire and learning by fire. Uh, therefore, many people go first time actually they come with, uh, there could be sometimes disappointment, so I wanted to do this one, but then weather was so bad. Like if you want to do one day research, I'll tell you a simple example. If you have one week work plan in Antarctica, you need to plan for at least one month. If you plan for one month, then you can do carry out one week. Because in between, weather going to be bad, things are going to be difficult, situation can be different than what you thought. So always plan at least three times more time, effort than actually you originally plan it. Then only you can actually get a good result from Antarctica. Climate, uh, climate things of when you were doing the research. So, sir, what are the other fields where we could more be focused on? The and, sir, in the uh, very beginning of the section, you said uh, when you uh, took into the uh, research field, you were you didn't know anything about the field, but you just uh, kept out of the crowd and you followed your part. So, what was the uh, one motivating thing or that one thing that you uh, saw in this field that you um, pursued this field, sir, research field? Answering your first question, there are everything you, what you research, you think about biological science, atmospheric science, earth sciences, physical science, anything you can carry out now. What you can carry out here, you can also carry out there in a different perspective. You can't just repeat what you do there. there the things are, the outlook could be different, but the areas, the larger domain would be similar. So it is up to you before you actually even take up any research in Antarctica, at least uh, carry out a basic understanding at least for a year. You can't get from internet uh, googling actually at uh, a lot of information. There will be a lot of information. Information is one thing, knowledge is different thing. You know, out of information, getting the knowledge actually takes time. So uh, a research student, the most important uh, requirement is therefore a lot of study of things, understand things, then take up a research. Rather than just tell it, somebody is telling, okay, you go to Antarctica and come back. Never do that. Okay, that's one first answer. 
second question actually what made uh, you said actually you asked me one question that uh, what was something which uh, made me oh yeah i can't again say one example but i can tell you one thing i tell you maybe my bringing up in a village without any facilities in 1970s and 80s made a lot of difference i had no expectations when i was completing masters i never knew i was doing research when i was doing the phd i never knew I, my only aim was to become a teacher i never thought actually and in fact i became a teacher and then i again left back then i would not thought actually that i would only work on the science and research so this has happened actually a kind of a actually i i like to put the you know that if you had a chance to read that paulo coelho that book you know the alchemist it's a fantastic small book actually i just followed it the similarly what you know you uh, there will be something but i do not know whether i'll get it or not but i was only one thing i ensured because i remember actually when i joined for research a lot of people discouraged me saying actually that uh, there are no jobs especially the, i was a national institute of oceanography they said that there are no permanent jobs these days in science so you should look for a small job because geology people can get job you should leave uh, but uh, what i what i did because i had a fellowship luckily uh, csr fellowship but then i also realized actually that uh, okay since i am i started doing it i will do whatever i can do sincerely so one thing i followed actually i systematically sincerely follow worked hard so which i did not know that i will get fruit or not tomorrow but it ensured actually in the long run if i look back now it helped me at that time i had no idea but indeed it helped me actually that i went from a village a very remote village which absolutely no facilities actually so anything was a wonder for me like ocean was a wonder for me i'll tell you because i was from india land ocean was a wonder so when i went to kochi in kusat actually it was a beautiful you know you know atmosphere for me the research you know the entire coast and everything so i was always uh, excited about something probably that helped me but i can't say that actually i just aimed something big and then no it may happen but it may not happen also fantastic questions actually you know that's why such school kids are much better than sometimes senior researchers yeah so yeah you know you know that actually the antarctica or any that place actually have challenges you cannot do everything going by yourself so these days we could try to put as much autonomous institutions autonomous uh, instruments observation systems we uh, you know for example you know measuring climate weather we put up autonomous uh, what you call the automatic weather stations we keep like in ice i was showing one instrument we keep it actually year throughout the year so you, to do that you should your technology should be to, the top of the line and you should have an expertise and experience in that like we keep in an ice an instrument actually you should have sufficient battery to last it for an at least year or two in fact our instrument lasted some like 3 year with battery but because these days it's possible you know you should uh, measure only minimum thing required so use a minimum energy so that you can extend the life of it one way of doing it actually setting up instruments auto you know automatic instruments or other another thing actually space based observations the space based observations actually the satellite based observations actually have advanced so far so much these days you can even uh, see what is there actually below about in you know, a less than 1 meter distance so you can do a lot of research based on this uh, using um, satellite data uh, ge ge geographic information systems and remote sensing data all kind of you know entire things and top of that the long, recent trend is actually we also have this uh, drones drone based uh, surveys we have no satellite on the top sitting which gives a larger area now we are as a person when we go there we have a small footprint but but there is also large sli slightly in between between the satellite and between the area so where you can use drones you operate a drone actually for you know for several few kilometers you can carry out surveys actually and things and all may not be everything possible but certain things like uh, the melting of ice happening if you want to measure small ponds actually in Ima, you know antarctica whether expanding or not drone surveys really help because you cannot physically go there because they are very dangerous they can be you know you can fall into them they give huge crevasse and so on so these drones are really you know area goes to areas where it doesn't go so it is possible with lots of uh, automatic uh, instrumentation thank you, thank you. Question here. a last question from a college student here finally yeah First year, okay. Uh, sir, I am from Department of Geography. 
സാർ ഈ ഐസ്കോർ സാമ്പിൾസിൽ ഏകദേശം എട്ട് ലക്ഷത്തോളം വർഷം പഴക്കമുള്ള സാമ്പിൾസ് കിട്ടുമല്ലോ അപ്പോൾ സാറിൻ്റെ ലൈഫ് എക്സ്പീരിയൻസിൽ എത്ര വർഷം മുൻപുള്ള സാമ്പിൾസിനെ പറ്റി പഠിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ട് പിന്നെ ഒരു ക്വസ്റ്റൻ കൂടെ ഈ തേഡ് പോളായ തേഡ് പോളായ നമ്മുടെ ഹിമാലയത്തിൽ ഐസ്കോർ സാമ്പിൾസിനെ പറ്റി പഠിക്കുന്നതിൻ്റെ സ്കോപ്പ് എത്രത്തോളം ഉണ്ട് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് ഓക്കെ ആദ്യത്തെ ആദ്യത്തെ ചോദ്യത്തെ ഉത്തരം എട്ട് ലക്ഷം അതായത് എയ്റ്റ് ഹൺഡ്രഡ് തൗസൻഡ് ഇയേഴ്സ് അതാണ് നമ്മൾ ഇതുവരെ ഉള്ള ഐസ് കിട്ടിയിട്ടുള്ളത് പക്ഷേ ഇപ്പോൾ ദ ഓൾസോ ദർ ആർ സ്റ്റഡീസ് വിച്ച് ഇസ് ഗോയിങ് ആൻഡ് മച്ച് ഡീപ്പർ വൺ വൺ മില്യൻ ഇയേഴ്സ് അതായത് പത്ത് ലക്ഷത്തോളം ദൂരത്തേക്കുള്ള ഇത് പോകുന്നുണ്ട് ദേ ആർ ട്രൈങ് ഇൻ ദാറ്റ് വേ സോ ആസ് ലോങ്ങർ ദ ക്ലൈമറ്റ് റെക്കോർഡ് ഇറ്റ് മേ ഗിവ് എ ബെറ്റർ ആൻസർ ബട്ട് വാട്ട് യു ഷുഡ് റിമെമ്പർ ആക്ച്വലി ദാറ്റ് ഇറ്റ് ഡിപ്പെൻഡ്സ് ഓൺ ദ പെർസ്പെക്റ്റീവ് ലൈക്ക് ഫോർ എക്സാമ്പിൾ ഇഫ് ഐ വോണ്ട് ടു സാമ്പിൾ ദിസ് ദിസ് മെനി പീപ്പിൾ സെറ്റിംഗ് ദർ I can just pick one person from here and one person from here. It may provide an idea of how do this student's behavior is. But if I want to really uh, you know, segregate them actually based on this, I may like to sample each of your school actually from Chinmaya, other schools and this school and this college and so on, isn't it? So if you, that's what I want to put a perspective. Those studies provide a long-term view, one-time long-term view. The kind of study which we carry out, we carry out in a very high risk. Like for example, those long term climate will not provide fine details of what happened in the recent past whereas we are interested actually what happened in the last few hundreds and thousands of years so my uh, my the, the present project actually will be studying last uh, 10000 or 10000 years previous to that i was only studying a few hundreds of years because it depends on the place where you are depending on the snow accumulation higher the accumulation even your deeper depth you'll get only a smaller time frame people go to interior antarctica where snowfall is very little i said actually it's a completely dry land actually it's a desert where there is no precipitation in land there you can get a longer time scale but you will not get uh, properly able to understand the climate of every year or every seasons and so on so it varies so what was your second question himalayathil actually ice core njangal padikunnilla njangal basically glaciers adhaayathu avada himaniyal mathramana padikunnu പക്ഷേ ഹിമാലയത്തിൽ ഗ്ലേഷ്യസ് പഠിക്കുക വെച്ചാൽ ബേസിക്കലി നമുക്ക് എന്താ കിട്ടുന്ന വെച്ചാൽ നമ്മളെ ഇന്ത്യൻ മൺസൂൺസ് ഇന്ത്യൻ മൺസൂൺ ആക്ച്വലി അഗെയിൻ നമുക്കുള്ള ക്ലൈമറ്റ് റെക്കോർഡ് എത്രയാണ് മാക്സിമം ഹൺഡ്രഡ് ഇയേഴ്സ് ഓഫ് പ്രിസിപ്റ്റേഷൻ ആൻഡ് മേ ബി ലെസ് ദാൻ ദാറ്റ് ഓഫ് ദി ടെമ്പറേച്ചർ റെക്കോർഡ് അതാണ് ഇപ്പോൾ ആക്ച്വലി ഐ എം ഡി എടുത്തുള്ളത് നേരെ മറിച്ച് നമുക്ക് ഈ ക്ലൈമറ്റ് എന്ന് പറയുന്ന സംഭവം വളരെ ഒരു ലോങ് ഇതായിട്ട് ഇറ്റ്സ് ഓൺ നാച്ചുറൽ സൈക്കിൾ ഉണ്ട് ഈ നാച്ചുറൽ സൈക്കിൾ പഠിക്കാണ്ട് നമുക്ക് ഇപ്പോഴത്തെ ഇപ്പോൾ സംഭവിക്കുന്നത് ഇന്നത്തെ കാരണം കൊണ്ട് മാത്രമൊന്നും പറയാൻ പറ്റില്ല അപ്പോൾ ഹിമാലയത്തിൽ പഠിച്ചാലുള്ള ഗുണം വെച്ചാൽ നമ്മുടെ ആക്ച്വൽ മൺസൂണിൻ്റെയും ഇവിടുത്തെ കാലാവസ്ഥയുടെയും ഒരു ഇതാണ് അവിടെ കാണാൻ പോകുന്നത് അതാണ് പ്രധാനമായിട്ട് ഈ മലത്തിന് കിട്ടാൻ പോകുന്നത് അതേപോലെ ഇവിടുത്തെ ലൈഫ് ലൈഫ് വുഡ് ബി ഫോളൻ ഇൻ ടു സോ മെനി തിങ്സ് ആർ ആക്ച്വലി ഇൻ ദോസ് ഐസ് ബിക്കോസ് ഹിമാലയ ഹാസ് മോസ്റ്റ് ഓഫ് ദീസ് യു നോ 